this was probably developed by a, a fertilizer guy. As you notice he put nitrogen as his lowest, and, and plants overall do need nitrogen more than anything else. If you take care of nitrogen, what's probably going to be your limiting factor? And you notice there's more than just nutrients on here. It's probably going to be water. And then we got water running down the water barrel, I guess. That makes sense. So, again, we're just going to try to take the fertility out as our limiting factor for, for high yields. Um, now, we do have recommendations by yield goal. Um, if you're in Alabama, they don't believe in this. Anybody here from Alabama? All right, good. Um, it's a long story, but my counterpart doesn't actually think this makes sense, but I tell him, well, if you don't make over 750, I guess it doesn't make sense. Uh, but basically, when I got here 18 years ago, our recommendation was 60 pounds an end for 750 pounds. That was the yield that we were shooting for. And we probably had guys make a little better of that, maybe a little more, but we, we basically did the research and, and increased that by 15 pounds an end for these increments, going from 750 to two bale, and two and a half, and then to three bale. And, uh, you know, back then, three bale was something to shoot for. Wasn't as common as it is now. I know what you're thinking, somebody already mentioned it the other day, does that mean I need to put um, 220 on four bale, go up another 15 pounds? You're not going to get into too much trouble with adding another 15 pounds if you're shooting for four bale, if you're making, used to making three, so uh, that's not a problem. But what we got, you know, we do have that recommendation when you drop your soil sample off to the county agents in Georgia, uh, you specify which one. I can tell you one of the one of the concerns when we went to this was that every farmer was going to shoot for three bale even when they should they didn't have that potential in that land and I don't think that happened I think I think people know the, the you know, kind of the, the potential of their land really these two do assume irrigation of course you had a year like last year where we had plentiful rainfall in a lot of places and uh, you know you probably were better off up in this region so. Just keep that in mind. Um, we also adjust the P and K, and it's not a huge increase. A lot of this is really just to take care of removal with a big crop, and also to help maintain levels in the soil. Really, to tell you, really to tell you that, and it depends on where you are on your soil test level, how much. But you know, really, is it really going to mean a difference of making 750 and 1500 if you put? 75 pounds of P versus 100, you know, that's not a guarantee. But that, that is overall what we recommend is to, to fertilize more, <coughs> excuse me, on the higher yield. Now, notice that the differences are more the lower your R, you know, the lower your soil test levels are. So the difference is a lot more pronounced. <coughs> we don't get down to 10 pounds of P unless we're clearing new land. We have been clearing more new land, it seems to be, these days. Um, you know, the differences are more down when you're down at 10 versus, you know, as they come together as you get up to a high end. So that's phosphorus. We've got the same thing for potassium. You can tell these are old slides. Um, but this is, we're still holding to this, to this concept of fertilizing a little more for, for higher yield. Uh, any questions on, on any of that? Um, of course, to tell folks, you know, we don't want to get too carried away. Um, we need to fertilize where we need to be according to yield goal. The fertilizer prices have crept up a little again. We we're just talking about that. I don't know if they crept up more than this. I, I know I've showed you this before and told you before 2003. We didn't even bother. We hardly talked about prices as much as they were low and steady. Back before, two, or before 2005, 28 cents per pound and 22 for. P205 and about 12 per pound of K20. As you know, between 2005 and 2008, they peaked. They come down pretty good in 2009, and they prep back up. Potash never really came down as far as the others. But uh, compared to last year, we have prepped up a little more. I think our economists, if you use the crop budgets to do the crop comparison out of UGA, uh, I believe they're using 70 cents per pound of hand 
55 for P205 and, and 60 for K20. That sound about in line, Jeff? Yeah. I think that's about right. So what I wanted to do with the rest of my time this morning is, uh, I don't know if they have them out there, if you got them from your counties, we have uh, the, the cotton production guide. Um, we update that every year. I update the soil fertility section, try to put in <coughs> and emphasize some of the latest things that are happening just to kind of really base it off the questions I get from county agents the year before, et cetera. Um, but there's a couple things going on. Um, and we'll work through these <coughs> by section, but uh, I wanted to make a few comments about lime, dolomitic versus calcitic, and also you might have heard me talk about it before, but there's some folks recommending some pretty high rates of lime, and we probably need to address that. Uh, but first, the calcitic <coughs> versus dolomitic. Uh, between 2005 and 2010, this is the lime sold in Georgia as reported to the Department of Ag Lab in, 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 in Atlanta. You know, we, we used to use almost all dolomitic and very low calcitic, and now, 2010, I don't have 11 and 12 here, I think it looks pretty similar. We're using a lot more calcitic lime. Of course, the difference is the dolomitic, the dolomitic lime has magnesium in it. By law, it has to have at least 6%. Calcitic usually has very little magnesium in it. So, yes, calcitic lime is cheaper, but it should be because it doesn't have magnesium in it. And, and I don't have a problem with use calcitic lime. Um, it, it's effective just like dolomitic lime. That's not an issue. Except for that, you know, you got to watch your magnesium levels. And basically what we tell folks is if you got good magnesium levels in your soil, uh, University of Georgia, we say if you have above 60 pounds of soil test magnesium, you want to use calcitic lime, that's fine. But if you're not getting any other magnesium in your system, with any other fertilizers, you see your magnesium start, your, hopefully your soil sample every year, you see your magnesium levels start dropping, I'll have you go back to the old mid line. It is still the, the cheapest source of magnesium fertilizer we have. Uh, lime, lime, we get a lot of use out of lime. We get, we get a pH adjustment, we get calcium, we get <coughs> magnesium. So, uh, not a dolomitic lime. So, I've had that question before, how low is too low, et cetera. There's our numbers right there. Like I said, there are other forms of magnesium that are a little more expensive, so if you want to do it the most economical, again, you use dolomitic for your magnesium. So. Um, these high rates of lime, the most we would ever recommend probably for cotton land would be probably two tons per acre. But there are folks out there promoting five, 10, 15, even 20 tons of lime per acre. I don't know if there are any in this room, and I apologize if you are, but I still think that's kind of crazy. I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, really. Um, and it concerns me from a number of standpoints. I, I have a number of concerns with real high rates of lime. One of them is manganese deficiency. We know that, that the micronutrients like manganese and zinc get tied up in soil the higher your pH goes. We have a chart. This was actually developed for soybeans, by the way. We use it for the other crops. And it's a guideline. And basically, the way you use this chart is you want to stay above the line. So if you notice, pH is about on here at the bottom. If you got a pH of 6, and if you have a soil test manganese of 8, you should be in pretty good shape. But what you notice is, let's say you have a pH of 6, manganese 8, you're right here. But now you put a bunch of lime on, and now you're up to 7. Now you, you really need about above 16, 17, 18 pounds of manganese to avoid deficiency. So, so if you run your pHs higher, you're probably going to have to fertilize with more manganese. Uh, manganese sometimes, if you don't catch it early, it's hard to correct. So, so that's a concern. Um, another concern with cotton is potassium deficiency. Um, I think the majority of the last couple of years in this breakout session, we spent a lot of time on potassium, and for good reason. I still say it's probably the number one issue fertility-wise on cotton. And if you think about it, and if you, if you know enough about cation exchange capacity and how calcium, magnesium, and potassium all compete with each other, you think about it. If you flood that soil with calcium, knock all those potassiums off the soil, make them susceptible to, to leaching or whatever, 
um, you're going to get you're going to get potassium or potassium deficiency. So you know, it's one of these things where you get too focused on one thing and overdoing it with one thing, you're going to mess something else up. So uh, that's another reason I'm concerned about this high line uh, recommendation. While we're on the potash, let's talk about it in leaf spot. And hopefully you're going to have a chance to see Dr. Kemmerite's talk. Um, because this one gets interesting. Um, for a number of years, we have seen this particular leaf spot called Stemphilium. We know it's linked to potassium deficiency. And Bob and I have done a number of trials to show that basically um, you can fix this one with potassium, but fungicides are not very effective, especially if you don't fix the potassium. Even then, you can get too late, and it's hard to fix it with potassium, too. So you got that issue going on. In fact, I think I put a slide in here. That's how bad it can get. <coughs> and there are other ones, Sircosper and Altamari, we've had around. This one came in about 95, and we've seen it um, come. And, and basically, we know it's related to potassium. And I think even last year, we told you, you know, right when you think you got it all figured out, all right, this leaf spot's related to potassium, we got it figured out. Then along comes a new one called corn esper. I think Bob's referring to this as target spot now. I wish he had done that earlier. <laughs> By the time I learned how to say and spell corn esper, he goes to target spot. <laughs> well, I didn't call him target spot from the beginning. I could have handled that better. But, uh, I'm still proud I know how to say corn esper. Um, this one does not appear to be related to potassium. And you need to talk to Bob that it sure seems that you can do some good with fungicides. Um, the potassium probably won't help you. Even though this looks yellow around this leaf and the rest of this leaf is green, this is a very close up picture. And I wish I had a picture more in the field of, of corn esper because these are, these can, especially when the spots are little, sometimes it can be hard to identify stem phyllium versus corn esper, et cetera. And now you do really need to know which one it is because one, you know, you have a chance of maybe fixing the potassium and another you're going to use a fungicide. Um, I guess the best I can explain it is, you know, a, a potassium deficiency, deficiency of stem phyllium will look like this. It, you know, the plants will be kind of have that yellow bronzy look. A lot of it will be through the whole plant, etc. And that's where you're going to see those leaf spots. For an esper, I wish I had a good picture of it. But actually this is a lot of time, it's in your best cotton. You might not even know you have it. A lot of times it's in even rank cotton. And it's in the middle of the canopy. It doesn't appear on the top where you can see it first. In fact, a lot of times, unless you're out there walking through the cotton, physically walking through the cotton, you might not even know you have it. When you're walking through the cotton, you're going to notice some yellowish uh, <coughs> leaves maybe in the center of the canopy with these bigger lesions on them. Uh, Bob will tell you it splashes up from the can or from the soil, gets into the middle of the canopy. And, uh, and, and that's where it affects your yield potential is in the middle of that plant. I don't know how you get the fungicide down there, by the way. That's another question for Bob. Um, but, but they've been spraying it, you know, doing things to spray it. But, but two, two different beasts there. And now it's really important. We can't just call it leaf spot. You've got to know which leaf spot you have. Because again, um, you got this one potassium and this one not. I threw this slide in there to show you from one of our trials, going back to the stem phyllium, um, both of these plots had headline <coughs> on, but this plot had zero potash per acre and this had 180. And again, it didn't, it didn't help it with the fungicide alone if you had a pot, potash problem. The other thing you'll notice is this does have some spots on it. And, and basically what happens is that for this one, for stem phyllium, the potash deficiency, what it does is it makes that leaf kind of weak susceptible to these spots and when they get on there they can just take over you can get stem phyllium on a healthy leaf with good potash and it might get some spots but they won't get very big take over and affect the yield of the plant so that's another thing we learned uh, we were fortunate uh, this was on from an on-farm trial in Cockle County uh, Scott Brown the county agent at the time said he could guarantee us a field where we'd see potash deficiency and, and, and he was right and uh, I don't have the yield to go along with this, but I wanted to show you those pictures. Any questions on any of that? What's the next leaf spot going to be? That's what I want to know. 
What's it going to look like? Yeah, Josh. So, Glenn, are, you're saying y'all put this, the headline and the potash out together. Yeah, we, uh, we knew we had low potash field to begin with, and we had plots that had no potash and some had high, and then we sprayed. We had like, you know, we had no spray, we have a zero control. We had some with potash, we had some with headline, and we had some with potash and, and headline. So okay. we, we had them all. And this is basically from the plots where there's no potash fertilizer, that was 180 pounds of potash fertilizer, and they both got headline. That's where those are from. Good question. Um, don't have any really magic bullets with potash deficiency besides what we've been talking about is just you know get a good soil sample and fertilize according to soil test all the planting. You might want to split potash on a deep sand. Uh, I have not seen an advantage of doing splits on a Tifton type soil. Uh, and then the others consider foliar. We know foliar potassium will work. Um, when you are on that kind of what I call the bubble of sufficiency where you, you know, if you have plenty of potash out there, the foliar obviously is not going to help you. But if you're kind of deficient, right on that edge you get deficient, it might. <coughs> on, the, on the flip side, if you're this deficient, foliar probably ain't going to help you either. It's too late, too far gone. So there's limits to it too. Alright. Um, let's switch to nitrogen. Um, what's going on with nitrogen? Uh, these are the numbers from nitrogen fertilizer sold in Georgia. So this is all crops, just not cotton. But you notice we use very little anhydrous. We use some ammonium sulfate. A lot of that time, a lot of times, that's to get sulfur into our system. Ammonium nitrate, and urea. These numbers, if you went back 10 years, they'd probably be flip flopped. But with regulations on ammonium nitrate, ammonium nitrate now, when urea went up. And then here's nitrogen solutions, which we're using a lot of. And normally back, you can say nitrogen solutions, that's probably just 28005 or 32 or whatever. But now there are some others out there that are included in this. And I wanted to mention some of those. Um, 28005, you start with 32%. You add ammonium thiosulfate. Composition about 50% urea. 25% ammonium and 25% nitrate. So it's got all three forms. Sounds good, spread your risk. It's a good fertilizer. Um, one thing you gotta remember is that, why is it important even to know what form you're in, which is better for cotton, et cetera. You know, urea can be susceptible to volatilization. Nitrate can be <coughs> susceptible to leaching. And then ammonium probably is one of our better forms, if you will. Uh, but that's 32. Uh, another product that's been around for a long time is getting distributed more now is you, you end up with an 18003. You have this 19 and you add the ammonium thiosulfate. And it looks different, as you can see. It's about 60% nitrate, 40% ammonium, no urea. So the volatilization issues go out. Uh, you know, we've been looking at using ureas inhibitors on urea fertilizers to stop the volatilization. Obviously, it would not make sense to put a urease inhibitor on this material. It doesn't have any urea in it. Okay? The other thing, and I think I told you this before, if you heard me talk about these before, um, a lot of people, when this first come out, they say, oh, that's a lot of nitrate. That's going to that's gonna leach, and it's not going to work on cotton. And uh, we've been talking about this for two years or so, and somebody pointed out to me one time, they said, well, you know, that's not that much different than ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate is probably about 50% nitrate and 50% ammonium. We used ammonium nitrate for a long time on cotton with good results. So, and, and it has been performing well. I, I don't know if I put the data in here, but uh, I got away from putting a lot of data in my talks this year. Uh, but we've compared these two, 18003 and 28005, and the 18 actually compares very well. So a lot of times it, it edges out 28. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with 28, you need to get away from 28, but 18 is definitely a viable alternative. So, um, like I said, you really got volatilization, nitrate leaches, you know, the nitrogen cycle is a bit complicated and, and there's ways this stuff can get away from us. Um, I mentioned the urease inhibitors. 
Agnotane was the first one to come out, and then you had Nutrisphere come out, and then you had a lot of other products, a lot of other things. People say, hey, I think this works as a urease inhibitor, uh, including humane products. How many have heard of humanes? Uh, you know, it got to be a point where they're kind of, they're kind of a organic molecule, organic matter, or whatever, and you know, it seemed like everybody says, well, put that in your fertilizer and make it work better. Well, they say, well, maybe it'll deuriation inhibition too. Um, I don't have the slides to go along with this. I might have showed you this before, but we have a, a, a actual field closed chamber technique to measure volatilization. And what we do is, for example, this is untreated urea. This was the, the urea, granular urea, treated with a liquid humic acid. This is Nutrisphere. This is a solid humic acid. There's Agritane. There's one called Arborite. And there's the background. And the way you read this graph is, is the smaller the bar, the better job the product did. This is like golf, low score, low score wins. And basically what you see is that the humic acids and, 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 and these did not, were not very effective of, of preventing <coughs> ureation inhibition. Agritane has a known chemical called MBPT documented in research that shows it's ureation inhibitor. One of the reasons I showed this slide today is I wanted to show you this one because this is a new one you might not have heard of. And guess what? It's got MBPT in it too. So, Makes perfect sense to me that that one would work. And I don't know why I do the backgrounds anymore. We usually get very little background volatilization. It's all coming from me. Any questions on any of those? Still get a lot of questions on on those products. Glenn, do you find any? You know, there's so many of these. I used to call them snake oils, but I'll tell you, growth enhancers. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got one. These folks that watch uh, RFD TV, you see these people up there. I was on that show one time. And, uh, were you on there? I, I was one that. time, yeah. yeah. That's but, a... uh, are, is there anything to those claims that they're making on the uh, gallons that you can find? You know, you're going to get me in trouble, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> I was asked to give a talk on snake bulls one time. I'll never do it again. And, uh, and one of my things, Johnny, is, is and you might have heard me say this before, is that uh, I got different categories of snake bulls. I got what I call a pure snake oil. That's something man, you ain't got a chance that thing ever helped me. It doesn't make any sense. And then you got things that, in theory, they make sense, but when you take them to the field, they don't produce or they don't produce consistently. And then you also have what I call snake oil rates. You have some legitimate products out there, but they say mine's so much better, you just need a thimble full. Well, you know, that doesn't normally turn out either. So, so you know, I got different categories, but but a lot of these products, I mean, I just have not seen the results. And I don't know whether, I guess they're getting them from the Midwest or whatever, but you know, we ain't growing or potatoes in Iowa. I love that, they call me, this works really good on potatoes in Iowa. So well, we're growing cotton in South Georgia, you know, a little bit different. Environment and the whole bit. So I see a lot of it the uh, Expo Field Day. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I don't know if they're all snake oil, but I just see things very unconventional. I can't test them all, but I've tested a number of them, and I can tell you, sometimes they'll work a little better. But then it gets, you know, sometimes it gets to the point where you get your money back from it. Is it economical? So I guess probably the best advice or whatever I can tell you is that. Good old fashioned fertilizer works pretty darn good on its own. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, Benji? Um, like I said, I, that first slide I showed you with that high yield cotton, I, that particular yield, I, year I tested about 12 different products and I, I had to guess which product I used on that. I hadn't used any of those extra products. Again, I'm not saying it might not have bumped you up a little or whatever, but you can pretty do pretty good on your own. So. And we need to keep looking at them because you never know when one's going to work. I mean, there are situations where a urease inhibitor like Agritain or Arborite, if you're going to use one, I want you to use one that works. There are situations where I think you, you're probably going to get your money out. Uh, granular urea on dry land cotton, you know, I mean, you, you know, you're going to lose some volatilization and you probably want to consider putting one of these on. But, but in this particular instance, if 
you can incorporate it with tillage or water it in, um, you know, you can make a lot of that volatilization issue go away. Or you can use something that doesn't even have you in it. So, good question. Um, but another thing that's come up with nitrogen besides source is, uh, is timing. And um, I know you've seen me show you this before with how our new varieties, they fruit up faster and more intensely. Uh, they crash a little early compared to when we used to grow 555. Um, so I want you to get that potash out there at planting and basically load the plant up, make sure it can handle when you go to fruiting. Well, you know, the question comes up, well, should I do the same thing with nitrogen? And actually, the answer is no. And the reason is, is because with nitrogen, if you put all your nitrogen up planting, especially in combination with all your potash at planting, when it gets to this point where it should be going fruiting, it's going to want to keep growing stalk and keep vegetating. So at this point, we still have the recommendation to split your nitrogen. Uh, you're in that 100 pound range, 30 pounds of planting, 70 in side dress. When should you side dress? We've always said first square to first bloom. Um, I don't know, do you want to go a little earlier? I don't know, again, I don't know. I don't know what happens if you give it a good shot right when it's fruiting. Might want to go fifth or sixth node, but it might be too early, I don't know. So, so I'm, at this point, I need to do that to verify this, but I, I really think that uh, we need to stick with our split applications of nitrogen. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. I mean, you need that 30 pounds early to get you get you through the square, and get you towards into that you know approaching bloom or whatever. Um, again, high rates of N and K together at planting can cause rank growth, and you might lose some opportunity on some early fruit. So, any questions on that? And again, rank growth could, could make you susceptible to poor and expert targets by. By the way, I don't know if I told you, but uh, you know, basically any variety that gets ranked like that has the environmental situation to get that target spot. Um, you know, obviously, if a, if a, if a variety is tend, has a tendency to be more ranked than another, you're probably going to see it more, but we've seen it in a number of different varieties. That's another question to ask Bob. All right, so nitrogen, you know, we got, we got things like urea versus liquids, we got timing, we got rates, we talked about that to begin with. The last thing I wanted to mention was placement. And with side dressing, you know, injecting versus surface dribble. Um, I still say on the surface with a, with a band, you're concentrated. So, so you shouldn't lose as much urea, for example, as if you had broadcast. So I don't have a problem with, with not incorporating. But I did want to mention starters. I still think if you're going to use a starter, stick to our standard recommendation of 10 gallons of 1034O in a 2x2 placement. I would not put anything in the furrow. Uh, if you came to the corn short course, there's been a lot of talk about putting starter fertilizers in the furrow on corn. Um, corn can put up with that a lot better than a cotton seed can. So um, I think we've got a real potential to, to, to hurt cotton stands if we put stuff in the furrow. So at this point, <coughs> I uh, really can't recommend putting anything to furrow. Yes, there are safe material, safer materials, and, and a lot of them, by the time you decrease your rate to make them safe and put it in the furrow, you are better off giving yourself a, a decent shot in a two by two placement. So, any questions on that? Uh, I hope I didn't send the wrong message with, uh, with some of that corn work because a lot of people said, oh, you're automatically, you're recommended in the furrow on corn, and that wasn't what it is. If you looked at my corn work, we had purposely made safer materials or rates that were low enough we thought it could handle it. Uh, I've actually done this on cotton and have thinned out a stand. Even putting 10 gallons of 1034O in the furrow, you'll, you'll most likely thin out your cotton stand. So, all right. Chicken litter, do we need to talk about chicken litter? Does everybody know it stinks? Another smell. You know, I don't know if there's a lot new going on with chicken litter. Uh, about the biggest thing is it's the same pile of chicken litters last year. Now it's worth a little more. <laughs> As fertilizer prices go up and down, it, the value of it goes up and down. And this is almost hard to believe, but if you do 
if you assume an analysis of a 332, which most of our litter seems to be, and you put fertilizer, these are 2011 fertilizer prices. Actually, I updated this. These are these are 2012 is what I showed you. When you do the calculations, it's about $70. I really hate to show this slide because the guy buying it for 35 worries that his price is going to go up on it. And one thing you got to notice about this, you notice I got it separated out by NP and K <coughs> the prices. I got the availability factors. Look at that availability of, of nitrogen. It's only about 60% available. If you don't knock that down, you're, you're going to come up with even a higher value. But the other thing you notice is that if you don't need any phosphorus, you got to take out about $25 worth of that value. So now you're getting down there more towards about, what, $45 or so, probably more about what people are paying for. And a lot of times, guys that are using litter, they have built up their phosphorus, they don't do phosphorus. So, you know, where does, in my opinion, chicken litter is best used on your poor land, especially your low phosphorus land. That's where you're going to get the most value out of it. So, I guess the biggest question I get with, with chicken litter is, is, is how early can I put it out? And that's a great question, say, for example, for cotton. And I put in that production guide this year, and I didn't put it this way, but basically, February is better than January. January is better than December. Does that make sense? Um, the longer you can hold off and get closer when the plant's going to need it. And, and the problem is, if you go out with chicken litter in December, and you don't have a cover crop or anything out there, you get some rain, you're going to lose you're going to lose some of that nitrogen, or a good part of that nitrogen. So you're going to lose you're going to lose a, a portion of that. So if you can hold off a little closer when we plant cotton, better off. I, I think in the book I said try to wait till February 1st. I had a guy last week ask me, can he, can he go? I said, yeah, we're getting close to February 1st. It's a logistics thing, as you know. It takes time to spread that litter. You got the time right now, et cetera. So, but what I'm telling you is that the a little bit later you can wait, the more use you'll get out of your nutrients. Does that make sense? Clear as mud. Um, I'm going to finish with with foliar, and it's kind of interesting because we talk in the winter time, and we're about as far away from foliar feeding as we can get, and we and we have a tendency not to talk about it. But I, it's probably one of the things I get the most questions on is foliar feeding cotton, <coughs> and a lot of it it's kind of like the chicken litter. Instead of how early now, it's how late can I foliar feed? So I'll, I'll tell you right now. It comes up every year, but once if you've been blooming for eight weeks, probably game over. Um, it's probably too late to utilize any foliar feeding. I, I'd much rather see you do your foliar feeding or actually during peak bloom, even second, third, fourth week of bloom, sixth, seventh, maybe. But you get out the eighth week of bloom, it's it's, it's late. Um, some of them bowls at the top might not even mature out, utilize that nutrients, etc. The emphasis should be on nitrogen, potassium, and boron. Unless you got a micronutrient deficiency, we want you to take care of that earlier. Um, products of choice still, uh, and these aren't the only ones, but we've used these for a long time and should be still fairly economical. Feed grade urea for nitrogen, potassium nitrate for potassium, which is getting hard to get, and it's soluble or 10% liquid for boron. Uh, like I said, there are others out there. Uh, but might be a little more expensive, but there are a number of them that work too, so keep that in mind. Can't foliar your feed if you don't have leaves. That's another one. You lost all your leaves. I've had that question before. Um, one thing, I, it's in the book, I, I, I skimmed through it, it reminded me too, is uh, once you get to about third or fourth week of bloom, we don't recommend putting any more fertilizer on the soil. There have been studies done to show once you get to about third week of bloom on cotton, soil applied nitrogen doesn't help you. So that's about the time if you're going to shift the foliar, you would do it. So if you're out there, for example, fourth week of bloom, you need a little nitrogen, definitely go the foliar route instead of putting it on the ground. So. That's what I call my four male cotton. I guess if we start making five and six, I'll have to stack a few more next to it. But, uh, well, I probably need to thank some folks. Um, Cotton Commission, Georgia Plant Food, Cotton Team, 
uh, off field, a technician, Benji Balder, sitting here on the front row, uh, do a lot of the research to bring you this information. It takes a lot of, a lot of help. So, have money. But I'm going to finish there and open it up for questions. How many pounds of potash do you have on the, the first picture you had at the expo? Yeah, that was, uh, I'd have to remember what the, uh, I would say approximately 60 pounds, because I think that was a solid medium. It was probably, it might have been whatever my, well, no, that, that one was in my plots, potassium rate, so I went off the recommendation. So I actually fertilized accordingly, so uh, it was roughly about 60, maybe 70 pounds at the most. If you've got a grower that, that hasn't soil sampled and he's just shotgunning pre-plant fertilizer, what would be a minimum amount of potash that you put out in a, say, a dope soft type soil? Minimum 50 or 60 pounds. I, it probably might be more, need to be more around 90. Um, I've showed that before. I actually had a low tested soil at the expo. And the recommendation was 135. And actually, I just showed, I just looked at this data yesterday, and if he had only put 90 out, he would have given up about 400 pound of lint. And it, it is where I made three bale. He would still have made 1100, but if he had put that extra potash on, he would have made 130. So it really depends on where your soil test levels are. But without guessing, I, I would put at least 50 or 60. I don't know. He, he might be in good shape. I don't know. But but 50 or 60 will get you a, a ways. 90 would be more common, and then if he's really low, he, he might even need more like 135. Yep. In your stenphilium trial in potash, that 180 pound uh, amount, was that in one shot? Yep, one shot, soil applied at plant. That's correct. You're ready to potash. Glenn, when we've been um, surf supplying fertilizer, strip till. <coughs> Surf the line. How many years do you have any idea how many years it takes you to equalize some of the zero to six inch? Homes? Yeah. Well, really, what we want you to do is start out with your levels good in the six inches, and then, for example, the pH when it drops is going to start from the surface and work down. And if you catch it early enough, you know, you, you can correct the top inch or two. I still think lime can move an inch or two in a year. Um, it's really hard to correct things down deep. Um, so, you know, lime, like I said, only probably moves about an inch or two a year. Potash, I think it depends on the rain. You know, how far will it move down, I don't know. And the other thing, of course, you're going to notice is your phosphorus builds up in the surface because it hardly moves at all in the whole bit. So, um, but uh, I would say lime, I'd, I'd bank on about an inch or two a year. Uh, is how far it's going to move, and potash, I don't know, it might move three or four, depending on the rainfall, I guess. Uh, well, I've tried that increment sampling, yeah. and I agree with that you get ready to do that. Yeah. I hear you. It's we, need, we, we need to have some guidelines on that. Well, you know, I had somebody called me the other day, and conservatively, what I would do, as I told them, is I would, because we recommend in a strip till to go out there and take a two or three inch sample and go back in the same hole go down about six or eight inches put it in another bucket that's the hard part and then it's dry and it caves in on you and you worry you got contamination and all but 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 you know when you're trying to find out the stratification thing and then when you get the results back you say well now what do I do and I would say I used to say lime by the top and fertilize by the bottom and the reason I say that again because your lime if you, if you get a pH problem it's going to start at the top and work its way down correct it early when you catch it at the top your fertilizer, you know, I think it's hard to get those nutrients down to that bottom one. Your bottom one's probably going to be the lower one. So to be conservative and to make sure you have enough, base your, base your fertilization on the bottom. And with potassium, that works pretty good. But phosphorus, it gets a little more tricky because, you know, you, if you, here's the question. If you really build up your phosphorus a lot, strip till the top two inches, even though the bottom six inches might be a little lower, is that enough to feed the crop? I don't know. It's a good question. It just depends on where the cotton roots feed from and whether they can still get that in the top. But it does get trickier, guys. That's for sure. Yeah. 
good branch would get red blue pig leaves up there. <laughs> that popped up, put out two by two. I learned two inches less, two inches below the seed. Two inches to the side and below the seed. Two right. inches less. Like I said, I have I've done it in my research. And I have seen it on the farm where you get that you get that applicator off and it dribbles in closer, right in with that furrow, even 10 gallons, 10 34 0, especially if it's dry. Um, which it gets dry a lot of times when we plant it around here. Um, it'll it'll it can it can hurt. On the on the pot actually put out that 180 pounds, was it straight murate or do you <coughs> I think I used DAP to get my nitrogen, phosphorus, and murate to get all my body. You like you like using just straight murate, or I mean, I mean, like I said, there's nothing wrong with came back. It's great fertilizer. You get some magnesium and sulfur too, but uh, you know, pound for pound, murate still probably going to be your cheapest fruit if you if you just need cake. Because right. we we do have a recommendation of 10 pounds of sulfur on on cotton. You can get that a number of ways. You can get that uh, with ammonium sulfate, you know, granular planting. You can get it with K mag. You can get it. 28.005, as long as you get the 10 pounds out there. Uh, any other questions? All right, thanks for coming. I think we're on time. Have a good rest of the conference. I'll be around all day, so if you have any more questions, let me know.